It's Wednesday, May 11th, 2011. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, how we got into all this stuff. Let's do this. So a couple days ago, I'm biking over the bridge. Biking over the bridge, like you do. Coming over here, and I see this guy on a bike. And it's a normal bike with two wheels, pedals, seat, handlebars. And clearly some other factor. The seats and handlebars were like at least six or seven feet off the ground. (laughs) And I'm like, look at this fucking hipster. So it wasn't a bike with one really big wheel and one really tiny wheel. (laughs) Nope. It was a perfectly normal bike. It just happened to be that these seat and handlebars and I guess pedals were elevated You know, it was basically a very tall frame, you know, uh, and I was like... I'd be worried I'd hit my head on that bridge. I also would, but he did. I guess he didn't. I don't know how he got on the bike to begin with, Um, but I was like, look at this fucking hipster, and I wanted to take a picture and put him on that website, look at this fucking hipster, (laughs) but I I was biking, so now... Now, why is it that someone like that is now a hipster, when at RIT, (laughs) someone like that was just a guy? Because uh, well, there were people who did crap like that. No, I mean, they had unicycles, which are normal. Ah, uh, they also apparently now there's that picture of that weird ass cow bike. Cow bike. Oh yeah, that, yeah. That's art. Is it art or yes. is it a hipster? It's art. Hipster or art. The point is, I'm uh, now I'm thinking right. I gotta get one of those, uh, you know, sporty wearing your helmet camera things. Whatever. They're not that expensive. No, but I. What's the one that the you that the guy was wearing when he accidentally fell off the mountain and survived? Oh, I don't Cause remember. Because that's the best hand. one, right? Because all the videos you see with that one are like ultra HD awesome. I saw a lot of people when I was skiing. Right, they had mm-hmm. flip cameras and they had things designed to hold a flip camera on their helmets. I don't want to do that. I want I want one of the ones that's designed to do that, and I don't want it to look dorky. It's got to be you know, it can't be like sticking out like an antenna. It's got to be you know. Normal. See, I don't, I don't know. I thought it, it'd be cool in one way, but at the same time, I don't mountain bike anymore. So what are you going to see? You're going to see the same thing a car sees when it goes around New York. Well, no, but the point is, is actually, you actually see a lot more than what a car sees because you don't have a roof, and you, you're right? So you have a much wider angle of view in um, general. Yeah, but in terms Even of, though a camera has a less angle of view than my eyeballs. But I'm saying in terms of me biking to work, you're going to see what a car sees. Right, but basically what you'll do is, you know, it's, I'll just leave it on whenever I'm biking around. Oh, and then if something happens, and if you go something back. happens, like look at this fucking hipster, then when I get home, I'll just edit that out and put it on YouTube and delete everything else on the camera. I'm not gonna, you know, make a video of going to work. That's boring as hell. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, not a bad idea. Yeah. Plus, I can be, I can make videos like, look, this is how to get on the secret stairs. Yeah. I heard you finally found the secret stairs. I found the secret stairs. You see how they're kind of not obvious. Incredibly not obvious. I and mean, there's no one even anywhere near them, which I don't think anyone uses them, which is why they're... I've never seen someone going in, but I have seen many people coming out as I was coming out. No, I'm gonna. I'm going in. Uh, when am I going to be able to go in? This weekend we're playing Diplomacy, and then I'm going to Spot Castle. I might go this weekend. Oh. Because I'm definitely not going next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. Maybe the weekend after that I could go again. What is next weekend? What? All right, Bar Camp. Bar Camp. Bar Camp. And also Library Overnight. Yeah. So Come on, you can fit it in between the library and the Bar Camp. All two hours in between. <laughs> two hours, you could make it over the RFK and back down. Uh, from the library? Take, go from the light well, where's bar camp? Uh on fifty something on Sixth Avenue. I think in two hours I, you could go from the library up after over be the, after being up all night. Yeah. Over the RFK, back around, back to uh bar camp. Yeah, no. One time when I was in high school, I had like the f- more than forty eight hours of not sleeping because I had an all night party, like after school, like a rollerblading, like all night thing. And then the next day I had a quiz bowl tournament, like in the morning. That was all day. And then that night, I went to back to the school, and we broke into the band director's office and painted it all night. And then the next morning, as I was driving home, I ran a bunch of stoplights, and then I fell asleep in my car, just parked on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the library thing does have a sleeping room, but it, it's only for power naps, apparently. And, uh, yeah. You're not going to want to sleep through that. I might take the Friday off and sleep and wake up and go to the library. Ah. Anyway. Anyway, so it's Wednesday. Tons of anime news. The industry is just abuzz with activity currently. Oh, I'm sure. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, I think the only reason it's becoming 
popular in our forum in that people are talking about it. It's because there's no ponies anymore. I feel like ponies were drawing a lot of our forum's energy. And now that ponies are somewhat subsided temporarily, people are looking at other things. They're trying to get well, their I fix mean, I any tried, way they can. I mean, this pony energy, right? It was, it was so forceful and it had direction, right? But now that the ponies have faded and it's going into another season, I tried to manually steer and funnel that energy in a different direction. And the direction I attempted to steer it was the best direction. Hajime no Ippo. And uh, I... I have transferred my pony energies in that direction. I have transferred mine into not consuming like some people do, not simply watching what others have done, but making things myself. I'm also making things. While I'm behind on that pony video I've been working on for a while, it's almost done. And that other pony thing is almost done. Yeah, your pony energy is faded, huh? No, they actually are almost done. Uh -huh. Yeah. The first 90% takes 90% of the time, and the last 10% takes the other 90% yeah, well, of the time. Yeah, well, I have a third pony thing that interrupted <laughs> them momentarily, and Kineticon. But the third pony thing is actually really easy to make, and it, it much like Kanye Pony, does not have to be good because the concept is it. The Kanye I'm, Pony was real good, though. Yeah, but it, uh, that was minimum effort. That was like BS effort. That's pretty good. <laughs> Huh? Well, it's more well done than a lot of the videos out there. Yeah, it's not saying that much though. But I'm gonna mash up Fluttershy and the Dragon. All right. With my year with the Dragon. Good move. Yeah. You could also do Pete's Dragon. I, oh my God! I want to watch Pete's Dragon and do a show on it now. P or Puff the Magic Dragon. Eh. Or I am the last one. <laughs> you know, as much as I hated that movie. I love that movie. No, I know you love that movie. Yeah, because the movie was bad in every possible way. The plot was bullshit, but it had Sean Connery playing a dragon. You should do the video, except instead of using either the one of the two big dragons, do Spike, or he's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Wakfu is basically, I saw this forever. There were ads and stuff about it. It was one of those things where you'd see it and say, wow. That's a thing I that thought someone it was, is trying to promote. I thought it was a word that meant something like weeaboo or, you know, really? putinar. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know. I remember just at PAX, there'd be gigantic things about this. It was like a turn-based tactical, like RPG, MMO, something. And I'd see this crazy art, and I remember always thinking, wow, that reeks of effort and ignoring it. Mm -hmm. Like, just completely ignoring it. I mean, I ignore most things. It's not really a... I don't know, a complaint about a thing that I have ignored it because I have ignored the majority of things ever. And apparently among all the media blitz, there is a cartoon in France, in French. And I watched an episode of it. It was okay. But isn't this like a Square Enix thing? So why is the cartoon French? Uh, I don't know. I don't know much about it, but the cartoon is French. I guess they outsourced it to France because France is where... Most of the good animation that isn't coming from Japan comes from. Mm -hmm. And America, obviously. France is, like, big on the animation. And the cartoon's actually kind of funny. I don't know what... I, I mean, I'm not even going to geek bite it yet. This is, like, a pre-geek bite. Yeah. It might fill my need to watch something on this level until ponies come back. But it's not Just nearly watch, as good as ponies. You no Ippo. What the I'm also watching that. All right. Yeah. You haven't even watched finished watching Okudo no Ken, have I'm you? I'm also watching that. But you know what? Even Unlike some people, I'm creating. Uh, I'm making also, things. I'm also making things slowly. Yeah, also slowly. It's harder for me to make a program than it is for you to make a Kanye video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've been making programs, too. Yeah, you're not making the difficult programs I'm making. Not yet, no. Anyway, no. Uh, so uh, Blackjack. Everyone knows Blackjack. If you don't. What the fuck? You should watch some Blackjack. And read some Blackjack. But anyway. If you like House, you'll like Blackjack. Anyway, there's a Blackjack OAV, and it's 10 episodes. So 10 separate VHS tapes or DVDs were released over the course of the years from 1993 to 2000. So yeah, there are probably VHS tapes. And it was one episode per tape, right? But for the now, they're going to release an 11th and final OAV. 10 years after volume 10, we're going to get volume 11. Wow. How about that's crazy? Was it done recently? Was it like in a hopper? Is it new? No, it says the Blackjack original video anime series by the late Osamu Dezaki will get an 11th and final volume more than a decade after the previous volume. And uh, the original voice actors for Blackjack and Pinoco will reprise their roles and they will record their lines during a live stream on Nico Nico Doga on, Whoa. on Saturday, 
May 14th. So That's actually pretty cool. Japan time, 1 a.m. Eastern. So if you're <laughs> up at 1 a.m. and you go to Nico Nico, you can watch the voice actors record the lines for this 11th. So I heard what happens in this episode, actually. It resolves Princess Knight. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, we got to finish Astro Boy 80s, too, while we're at it. That's a good one. Because we got most of the way through. I forget what episode we were on. Though. I don't even know. We watched one where there was a train in the wilderness. Yeah. We thought the whole class of kids. When it went to the moon, all that stuff. Was that the same one with the bees, or was the bees a different one? The bees was before that, I think. Uh, I, don't, I can't. I don't know. Let's pick a random. We should watch the end and go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> that's the easiest way. I think that's a bad idea, but yeah. Yeah, or Hokodona can. I kind of just guess, because I always think... Think, oh, I just watched no, you episode know you, 24. No, you know you do. I will remember this, and then the next day I forget. Here's a secret of space. Wikipedia has a list of episodes for pretty much every show. You just go and find the synopsis and be like, oh, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, so anytime there's a long show, I just go wiki, space, list of My Little Pony episodes, for example. And then I look down the list, and I find the episode that I'm on, and then I watch it. So It works really well for Hokuto no Ken episodes, because there's 150 of them. Good luck yep. remembering. <laughs> So, things of the day. This is not the greatest thing in and of itself. The product, the thing, that is my thing of the day, is a cool concept executed, I would say, the bare minimum required. Like, this is the bottom of this kind of thing. But I think there's going to be a huge wave of this, like in the next five, six years or so, or so in terms of active prosthetics, mostly for costumers, cosplayers, and furries. Uh-huh. Basically, they're, you know, Nekomimi, the cat ears that people wear on their head. But they're a little different. They're robotic. They move. They, you know, they move around. They'll, like, twitch. They'll go flat. They'll perk up. They'll, like, turn at things. All right. But the way they do this isn't just random or with switches. It actually has one of those kind of toy-level shit-tier brainwave readers. And... Does it, it really read yeah, your brainwaves, or re is it just say it does, and it just sort of does things randomly? It's actually really easy to do that. Like, the uh, remember that toy that uh, I think Dorkly did, or, or uh, not Dorkly, before, Bleep Boop? They actually reviewed the Star Wars the Force Star trainer. Wars Force thing? Yeah, isn't that just random and bullshit also? No. It's really easy. To, I mean, basically, you look for certain basic mm. patterns in the overall brainwaves. That sort of stuff is actually kind of easy to do. Because I remember, you remember back in the day, there was a thing you could put on your finger that you were supposed to control the computer mouse with it? That they was like, this was in like the early, yeah, the mid-90s. Those thi the things that we use now that do that and actually work are based on the same principles. I still have a hard time believing this principle isn't uh, complete bullshit. You're completely wrong. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You're just absolutely. There's no way that it can actually be precise enough to where you're Scott, actually consciously controlling something. You're not consciously controlling them. Here's the thing. These, this is, I said shit tier. This is the bottom type. The Star Wars Force Trainer and things like that, they basically read the, like, the most overall frequencies because it's pretty trivial. We could very easily build equipment that could scan that level of brainwave. You can tell if someone is excited Relaxed. That's about it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So basically what these things do is if, you're, if your activity goes up at all, they perk up. And if it goes down, they go flat. And I don't know what causes them to twitch, but it's kind of cute. And while this is not the best product, I really think that there's going to be a big wave of act active prosthetics within the next decade. Um, so all I'm saying is I can make one that does things randomly, and you, no one will be able to tell the difference. Uh, at the same time, while that is possibly true for now, it'd be pretty easy to engage in tests to prove how it's reacting. When we get to the point where someone can wear them, and I could say, put them down, and they put them down, and I Scott, say, put them up, and they put them up, Scott, then... That that's is... an entirely different kind of thing. And two, there are games, a whole class of games, they don't work that well, but they work okay, where you can learn to do things like that. Yeah, if you have, like, an FMRI and not no, some actually, pair, pair of cat ears. Actually, no, you don't need an FMRI to do things like that. Uh-huh. Anyway, your ignorance aside, what do you have? So, uh, I, I didn't have a good thing of the day. So, I didn't want to use college humor, as is our fallback. So I went to fallback number two, cinemasker.com. And people ah, shit. I haven't we haven't talked about them in a while, but I just want to remind everyone there's a guy named James Rolfe. He is the awesome. He is like us. He is our kindred type person, even though we didn't meet him, even at Magfest. We wanted to meet him, and he was there. 
Uh, and he is the angry video game nerd. If you do not know, if you don't know the angry video game nerd, well, guess what? You, gotta- you know what? You know what? He's gonna take you to back to the past <laughs> to play the shitty games that sucked ass. That's right. Well, they still suck ass. That song will get stuck in your head, and you'll catch yourself <laughs> humming. He'd rather let a buffalo. That's right. But anyway, take a diarrhea dump in his ear. He's been coming out pretty. You know, he used to come out with videos pretty irregularly, right? Except for the month of October, we had a video every day. Uh, he's been coming out with videos much more regularly uh, as of late. At least one video every day. He'll even put out like a crap video or something that he just threw together just to put something out almost every weekday. Uh, and what he's been doing a lot lately is Ninja Turtles, animated Ninja Turtles. I think it's because he's rewatching animated Ninja Turtles, all of it. So it's on his brain, so he's making a lot of videos. I have this weird feeling that that show will not be as good as I remember it being. No, don't. I don't think you should actually rewatch the show like he is. I think you should just watch his reviews of the show, where he's cut out clips and put them in an entertaining context. However, there's one particular Ninja Turtle video that is my thing of the day that he has put up, his most recent video as of this podcast, and it is Michelangelo's Pizza Taste Test. If you remember, during the Ninja Turtle show... Michelangelo would, you know, the animation at least. Uh, Michelangelo would was often, a party dude. He was a party dude, and he would always order pizzas. He was he cared about pe- all the turtles love pizza, but Michelangelo loved it ten times as much. Kind of like how in the uh, Mario cartoon, they all cared about lasagna and pasta. Yep. Well, uh, Michelangelo, if you don't remember, he always got crazy fucked up pizzas, like pepperoni and marshmallow, or avocado chili pepper. That sounds really good. Clam sauce That pizza. still sounds really good. So uh, it's James Rolfe and a bunch of his friends had a party where they ordered a whole bunch of plain cheese pizzas, and they made every single one of Michelangelo's crazy pizzas uh, by applying the toppings to the plain cheese delivery pizza and, I guess, heating it up a bit. And then they took a pizza slicer and cut e- you know one slice of pizza into a bunch of little bits. So they each had pretty much a, a few bites of each nasty pizza. That, they w- that way they had enough room in the stomach to try all of them. And uh, he shows you pretty much a clip of Michelangelo say, saying what the pizza is and then them eating it and judging the different flavors. And it gets uh, – some of them are pretty nasty. Some of them are not as nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, anything with hot fudge was the worst. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So yeah, the, this video is awesome. So in the, I'm hungry now. And it goes – it goes. I ver- want that avocado chili pepper pizza. It goes very much in line with uh, – our hacking the boardwalk episode of you know. Oh my God! I got a link to that now. Yeah. For so get to the meta moment. This is meta because it involves us. But many years ago, and the fact that it was many years ago makes me feel really old. We were in Wildwood, our kind of perennial summer writers retreat hangout, where we dick around and don't do anything except sleep on the beach and eat Russo subs, ninety nine cent pizza, and one day we just we you know there's a place. That has like deep fried Oreos, deep fried, you know, whatever. Why are we retelling a story that was already in a podcast that people could just listen to? Because that was in a podcast from many, many, many years ago. They could, it's still there. Anyway, I, I briefly. So the guy was like, you know, he has all this stuff and he'll fry whatever. So we go up to him. We're like, if we bring you a slice of pepperoni pizza, will you deep fry it? And we photo blogged us going through all of this and eventually eating the deep fried pepperoni pizza. Yeah. It was pretty epic and it tasted like a Hot Pocket. Yeah, pretty much. But this weekend on Friday is the uh, Nerd NYC board game night that we're always at at Think Coffee downtown. Yep. If you want to hang out with us and actually hang out, as many listeners have been doing recently, come down, play some games. We'll be there. We're friendly. Yep. Already mentioned, Bar Camp NYC is uh, May 21st and 22nd. You got to go to the Bar Camp NYC 6 website to register. It's free. And then you just got to show up. Uh, Tomorrow, Thursday, May 12th, from 7 p.m. until whenever. I don't know exactly when. I thought that was Friday uh, the 13th at 7 p.m. No. No? No, it's May 12th. Okay. 7 p.m., no quarter exhibition of games. This is in New York City on Broadway, 721 Broadway. It is an exhibition of games. All right. That It looks really cool. It's NYU's uh, Game Center. Nice. Uh, recess, Nerd NYC recess is June 18th, and that's all, that's all the events we'll talk about for now. Yeah, PAX, PAX Dev, all that, we'll probably be at him. That's a long time from now. Yep. Uh, and you can't come, but this weekend we're playing an epic game of diplomacy for the uh, Worldwide Championship belt. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have some pictures of the winner, maybe some video. <laughs> maybe. And, uh, you should, uh, join our forum. Forum's rocking. If you, uh... 
you know, a lot of people out there, you're lurkers, or maybe, you know, you don't do internet forums, or you think you don't do internet forums. Well, don't do internet forums. They all suck, except ch- ours. Change your ways and go to forum.frontrowcrew.com, sign up. Make sure you just, you can type something in the box that says, why are you joining? Just type, it doesn't matter what you type. You just have to type something that makes me believe that you are not a robot, that you're an actual human being. And then you'll be approved, and then you can talk to everybody. And people are talking all the time about ponies. The real reason our forum is better than all the others, and you should know this going in, we have very few rules. You can do whatever you want as long as you do it with correct grammar and spelling. Yep. That's really it. Yep. So we did a slightly similar show a long time ago about how to get into all these things. How to get into, you know, it was a how to get into, I think, week, right? It was how to get into, right? And it was basically, if you haven't done X geekery here is how to start doing X geekery And the thing is, the answer almost always is... Start doing it. Do whatever it is. I want to get into playing flute. Well, you know what? Go get yourself a flute. And start playing it and go and get some flute instructional videos and search for how to play flute on Google and read the instructions and do it. And replace flute with anything, you know? I want to do electronics. Go buy an Arduino and just go to the websites, read what it says, and follow the instructions. That's how you do things. Um, But we don't actually do a whole lot of, you know, personal reflection kind of podcasts on Geek Nights. Even though people want it. And I think what happened was we used to a lot more. In the old days, because we had a gigantic. Oh yeah, we store. had like, geek fables. Were we very, had a store uh, of anecdotes reaching back decades, and we, we used most of up the no- the notable and memorable. In ones. well over seven hundred episodes of Geek Nights, we have talked about the bamboo. We've talked about the vision. We've talked about the vision and the bamboo go together. Oh my God, the vision happened. The vision, well, the vision precursor was before the bamboo, but the vision culminated. Without the vision, there would have been no bamboo. <laughs> That bamboo was one of the darker visions. <laughs> that was perhaps the worst thing. What that do has you see? Ever had bamboo? You know what, <laughs> <laughs> what do you smell? No. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you know, but, but the other thing is, you know, I've said this before, but like, I want to try to make it so that you know, if there's a Geek Nights episode, that the anyone who, even if it's your any episode, should be able to be someone's first episode. So we shouldn't talk about anything that's like community based or so personal that it excludes, like, oh. Um, Nushu was doing something on the farm. And right. Blah, 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 blah. So anyone who isn't already a Geek Nights listener doesn't give two shits about that, you know. But this, you know, if we talk about our own personal stories, how did you start? How did you discover? No, Scott, X? I'm worried here. We're we're starting this show With by the rationalizing meta? why we're doing this show. We're like, don't worry, don't worry. Here's why we're doing it. It's okay. Well, trust because us, if any time you do something contrary to your philosophy on the internet, you risk being called out. How is this in any way contrary? Uh, because no, in fact, like, people like the anecdotes. They, they, the only time people get mad and call us out is when you talk about politics. <laughs> Which I don't want to talk about. I always do. I can get Scogio on here. Anyway. So, let's start with comics. Regular superhero comics. Well, it doesn't have to be superhero. I mean, comics are comics, right? Ah, but I got into... I Well, I had three levels of comics. The, the first comics I got into were actually just... You know, Foxtrot kind of comics, Bloom course, County. I think everyone was that way, reading comics in yeah. the newspaper before reading any other sorts of comics. If I think way back, the first newspaper comics that I was aware of, like I, as a sentient human, recognized that what I was reading was a comic in a newspaper and that I was enjoying was Calvin and Hobbes, probably. Yeah, probably. Maybe a lot of that crap, like High and Lois and Kathy, because it was just there and I'd read it. Yeah, but I mean, like in those early days, reading comics in the newspaper, it was like a lot. I just read them all. I hated, uh, I just like ignored the vast majority of them. I hated them all, almost, but I read them all anyway. You know why? Because I was sitting at the table eating a bowl of cereal. And you know what? When you're eight. What are you going to read? When you're eight. Eating a bowl of cereal might as well take four years. You're going to read it. This you going to read the cereal box? That is infinite time. You've already read the cereal box. And you've already done the mini page. There's this great cyanide and happiness recently. A guy goes into the shitter to take a shit, right? Yep. He sits down. He's like, oh, no, I forgot my smartphone. What'll I do? And then it has this series of frames of, like, zooming in on his eye. And then his eye becomes stars. And endless cosmos is come and go. The infinite passing of epochs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you think we're impatient now? When I was eight? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd read the entirety of the funnies. And 
I don't know I why. I skipped over like the Rex Morgan MDs and the Funky Winker Beans. The thing is, Rex Morgan, there were like two words in the whole comic. Or Apartment so, 3Gs. So you say you don't read. You know what? I read them because there was nothing in them. <laughs> I did not process. I saw, but did not see. And what, al- what always did bother me, though, was like some newspapers that have some comics and others wouldn't. Oh, that was the worst because we got the Detroit Sometimes News. Sometimes you'd get a comic on Sunday, but you wouldn't get it during the week. Ah, uh, we got the Detroit News and the Detroit Free Press. So we got all the good comics. But if I went to anyone else's house and they got some shit newspaper, like I'd stay over to a friend's house and they'd have like USA Today. Ah. Uh, it was weird, though, right? Because even though I read comics in the newspaper, right, uh, I had, like, absolutely no interest in actual comic books. Like, I knew they existed, and I knew who these characters were because, like, I mean, I watched, uh, like, 60s Batman on t- reruns on TV. So I knew, you know, when I saw Batman 89, like, I knew who all these superheroes were. Superman, of course, I knew who Superman and Spider-Man were. But I had absolutely no interest in reading comics. Like, I looked down on comics. Like, I didn't want to read comic books. Well, see, I had this weird thing. When I, when I don't know why, I just didn't want to read them. The moment where I went from reading the newspaper comics because literally I had infinite amounts of time and I had to do something or I would have gone crazy, yep. I was when my parents would buy like the Bloom County compilation, the, uh, the big book of Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, we never bought any of those. We bought all of those. So basically, as soon as those appeared in my life, I read them and comics went from this kind of nothing activity to something I actively seeked out. And as a result, I only sought these specific comics that were good. And then from then on, I really only read like Calvin and Hobbes, yeah. Foxtrot, Overboard. For some reason, I have this weird fondness I don't even Overboard. know what Overboard is. Really? It was about I don't think pirates. We, we don't have that one. But now I wish we had that one because it's about pirates. It's about <laughs> pirates. And it's, it's very, it's like imagine if Dilbert were about pirates. Uh-huh. That's really the best way I can describe it. Like I even had like some... Like, I had uh, one of my friends gave me, like, an X-Men coloring book that was, like, early 80s X-Men. And I was like, who the Whoa. hell? I was like, who the hell are the X-Men? <laughs> uh, see, I also had, maybe it was just my family. We had every Mad Magazine going back to almost the beginning. Yeah, we did not have My Mad mom still has them. Every goddamn Mad Magazine. Did not have any Mad Magazines. Every one. But I knew Some that it things, existed and I had no interest. In fact, a lot of them are pretty valuable today because they're all Pro- in mint yeah, condition. Probably. So, as a kid, shortly after that, after reading, like, all these other comics, I found this Mad Collection I read every one of them. Yep. We also had these old, they smelled like old people books of like Peanuts. I've read almost every Peanuts I read, comic I, ever. I, I read least. those in my elementary school library. Ah. They're like little paperback ones. Had, yeah, the little paperback like, ones that yep. smelled bad and fell it's, apart. Yep, exactly. Same ones. So that is how I got into comics. I just had, in fact, my mom had all these old uh, like Fantastic Fours that I didn't like, but they were there. <laughs> I yeah, but like I really only liked like Peanuts and Overboard and, and Bloom County and all that. I learned, and that's actually kind of an aside. That's how I got into politics. Because as a kid, you don't really know. I mean, when I was young, I didn't know like right wing, left wing, Republican, anything. I didn't at either. All. I knew the Soviets want to nuke us and think you know the basic things that kids know. I didn't even know that until at that time. And I was really interested in the Gulf War because I was convinced that I knew how to fix it and that it was my duty to tell President Bush. Uh huh. And I got kind of frustrated and disturbed as a kid. I was worried that, like, if I didn't tell an adult that the war would keep going, I started to feel responsible for the war. <laughs> okay. I was a weird kid. But I got into politics because I read Bloom County so much that I knew all the proper nouns of 80s <laughs> politics in the U.S. See, because I read a lot of those comics and I didn't even understand that they were politi- political because a lot of them all basically have other jokes at the same time. Yeah, I guess I got interested in both, or at least I'd recognize names. I mean, of this is people. this is elementary school we're talking. Yeah, about. yeah. So that that's how I got into politics, but that's also how I got into comics, reading these big compilation books. See what happened to me, right? Didn't read superheroes because I thought they were stupid. Even as a little kid, I thought Superman was stupid. Well, yeah, I did too. I mean, you know, but it's like uh, I didn't actually, you know, I didn't actively think he was stupid. I just kind of didn't care at all. I thought superheroes were stupid as a kid. I just thought they were a dumb thing, and I wasn't interested. I mean, I like. 60s Batman when I was Adam I liked West when I was Batman in elementary movie. when I was in elementary school with Adam West I watched that movie endlessly I didn't I never actually saw that until much later but I, the 89 Batman I liked we had a VHS tape of it that I'd watch every now and then but it wasn't until like in the early 90s like 91 right I guess I was nine or ten eight nine ten something like that right my friend down the street who I'd go over to his house he suddenly was reading comic books and I was like what. 
Because, like, no one I knew had ever read comic books, and I didn't care, and I didn't... Yep, there were, like, one or two nerdy kids in my school who, you know, I was nerdy, but in different ways, who read comics, and everyone else, just no one cared it's about like comics. It's like I saw, like, Dennis the Menace reading comics in, you know, or, you know, in cartoons, or I saw Calvin reading comics. I had this weird impression of superhero comics. Maybe it's just because the only comics in my house were really, really old comics, and I'd only ever see comics in old comics referring to people reading comics. Comics were a thing that kids in the 20s read that nobody cares about today. Yeah, I never I saw... I thought they were like this archaic, lost art form. Yeah, I'd never actually seen people with comic books, nor did, you know, and I, even though I sort of knew they existed, I didn't want or care to read them. But then a kid down the street got them, and he was reading, like... Iron Man and Moon Knight and Moon Knight. You don't know Moon Knight? I know about Moon Knight. And in like Infinity Gauntlet and Morbius and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I didn't really read them, but you know what I did do? Huh? <laughs> I started collecting uh, the comic. Obviously, this was you know the early nineties. The cards. Yeah, I collected the cards before I learned who the X Men were from collecting the X Men cards because right. those cards had stats on the back. Yep. And yep. At the, for some reason, I was like, whoa. Wolverine has the strength of that, but but this Jean Grey character, yep, huh, yep. huh, and I got really interested based on that <laughs> and that alone. So in the early 90s, right, there was sort of this explosion, like, friend down the street is reading comics. I didn't really read any of his comics, but I saw that he was reading them. And then Comic Book Shock opens in the mall, right, right near my house. And then I went to the comic shop in the mall, and I was collecting baseball cards at the time, you know, because I had been doing that. I never collected those. Well, my dad basically would, like, buy a pack every week, and it was just so it just built up. Yep. Uh, I also would do, like, those sticker books. Like, I have an ALF sticker book that has 3D glasses and I had everything. a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one. I, I had, had that a, one. Yeah. And those were basically cards, but every, you know, the cards had two I collected stickers. a lot of weird things along those lines, like Beavis and Butthead. There was a trading card series that I just had. I had ALF trading card series. Yep. Uh... I had all the Nintendo ones. I didn't have Nintendo ones. But it's weird that we collected those cards for the comic books, but didn't read the comic books. Well, I did, right? See, it was it was basically shortly after, right? So it's like the, the X-Men cartoon came on the TV. You know, my friend down the street was reading comics. X-Men cartoon is what did it for me. I was going to the comic book store to buy these cards, right? And then, uh, you know, I bought... I started buying comics, and basically the thing was I didn't have a lot of money as a punk kid, right? And I spent most of the money on the cards, which are actually really expensive. So the only two comics I read as a kid were Spider-Man 2099 and Adjectiveless X-Men, and barely anything else at all. Ah, uh, for me it was the Uncanny X-Men and X-Men, but what had and X-Factor and X-Force, because basically I knew by then I knew about the X-Men and I was collecting the cards, but I yeah, didn't I'd read the comics at all. And independently, you know, when the cartoon came out, I got really into the cartoon. But not anything else. Like, just the cartoon was all I liked. I didn't care about the comics mm. related to it. Mm. But around all those times, comic books got suddenly popular. Like, suddenly I started seeing everyone around reading them. Well, because it was because people, uh, you know, there was a huge speculation boom going on, you know, yep. which was pretty much the story of comics in the 90s. So and I was into course, board games. Of course, being young, impressionable 10-year-olds, we got caught up in that real easily. But I was into board games, right? So I got this X-Men board game. Nah. <laughs> Uh, and it was pretty shit, but it came with all these figures that I painted poorly, <laughs> and it came with one copy of X-Men, and it was right after the end of the Executioner's Song was where that comic was. Yep. And I, You know what? Executioner's Song trade paperback uh, is coming out real soon. I'm ordering it. Oh, shit. I, I, I should read that. <laughs> That's the only, that is the only story in all of X-Men I've read all the way through. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. So basically, this comic that came with the game was like the denouement to that. It was like Beast and Cyclops just talking about all the shit that went down. <laughs> and I was like, this isn't what I expected. It's mostly words. Duh. Mm. Well, that was, you know, it was probably Claremont who is the wordiest, you know, Claremont and Byrne are the wordiest motherfuckers in the universe. And as a result, I got this mistaken impression. I was like, oh, comics are actually kind of erudite. Look at all that metaphor. Mm. They were trying to be. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> know better. So then I went and I bought the comic that came before that one. And then I realized there was this story and I had to buy a bunch of X-Factors and X-Forces and all this yeah. bullshit. And I got it all and I read it all. And I kept reading X-Men from that point until about Phalanx, all that stuff. And then I just stopped. I couldn't I, tell you why. I stopped. I can tell you exactly why I stopped because the comic book store in the mall went out of business. So I couldn't get, uh, I couldn't get the next comic. So then basically I just... You know, it's it's weird. It's like the comic book store disappeared, 
And I was just like, uh, and I'm, I mean, X, something happened in X Men, uh, like around issue 30, 31, where it's like one issue like skipped a bunch of plot. And I was like, what the fuck? Or whatever. And I really only cared about Spider Man 2099 because X Men dicked me over like that. But then it, the comic store closed and I couldn't get the next issue. And I tried like a little bit and then I gave up until the year like 2001. Right in the year two thousand and one, I can tell you exactly what happened because it's much more recent. Uh, I was already back into the Animes. Right, we were at RIT, and uh, we went to Borders a lot to look at the mangas there. Yep. And because of the anime, we were looking at mangas. And what I saw on the comic shelf, they had you know over by the magazine racks, not by the manga shelf, but by the magazine racks. It was Ghost in the Shell two number one. So I picked that up, and I was actually going to Borders to buy that comic book and that comic book only. It yep. happened. And I, then uh, in our second year at RIT, my friend Ian shows up, all right, because uh, he went to RIT oh, also. Oh, right. That's when you guys would go to the secret mall. And he said, hey, you want to go? Mall. He said, hey, you want to go to the comic shop? And I'm like, yeah, I'd need the next issue of Ghost in the Shell. If they have it there, then you know I won't have to go to Borders, and maybe it'll be better there. So that was when I learned of the comic shop culture, because that was the shop where like Luke and everybody had their account. And well, their no, folder. they went to a different shop than us. All right, they, they, they went, went to, to uh, they went to Comic Book Heaven, which is run by an old guy. At yeah, the, because there was drama between that guy and the anime club. I had to deal with. Yeah, no, that was a different one. That was uh, Comic Empire Comics. That was the third shop. I didn't know there was a third shop. Yes, the one. The only one I actually ever went to to buy comics was Empire the one in the Hippie Comics mall. was the drama. Comic Book Heaven was the old guy. The one that I went to in the Hippie Mall was comic books, etc. Rochester had a lot of nerdy stuff because it yeah. also had Millennium Games. That Hippie Mall was pretty great. The Hippie Mall was pretty great. Comic Etc. was a pretty great shop. I like the way they were organized by sort of feel, you know. And the thing is, that when I went to Comics Etc. Right. I try. I basically wanted to ignore the Marvel and the DC stuff because I didn't, you know, I was money conscious and I didn't want to get caught up in, you know, these crossovers and all that bullshit that I knew was going on. So I was, I would only buy like miniseries if it was a Marvel or DC thing, you know. Like I bought, uh, and I, I basically just looked at the shelf and picked stuff out. Like I read this. Uh, it was a series mostly for kids. Sentinel. It was a self-contained series about a sentinel. This kid finds a sentinel in his backyard. It's I still have it. It's pretty awesome. I liked a, it. There was a Voltron comic that was pretty good, uh, and I was also starting to you know see what mangas were coming out. Like you know, I bought all of Akira for the first time. I just finished buying it for the second. time. I have a much. It's weird. I have such an like older and spotty history of manga because yeah. anime I get into you know when I was eight, fourth grade. My mom made me watch Vampire Hunter D against my will. Yep. But around I watched it all the anime I could get forever, and then it wasn't until high school. Because I knew vaguely around like my freshman year of high school that manga existed. Mm. I heard of it. I was like, I heard that anime was all based on Japanese comics. Mm -hmm. And I got really interested in that. And you couldn't get it. It just wasn't anywhere. Well, actually, the thing was, is in the comic shop that I went to as a kid that didn't close yet, there was one small area that I always completely ignored that had a whole bunch of Ron Mahaf tapes and probably, you know, they, they probably had all those, like, Viz manga that were in individual issues, you know, uh, and they probably had, you know, the, the all that stuff. Ah, I, see, the I comic just, shops near me didn't have anything like that. And so. I just completely ignored it and didn't give a shit. The first manga I ever just saw. Just like I ignored all those image comics. I, I basically, yeah. I, was, I was really, I guess it was because I didn't have enough money to buy all the comics. That there was just something in me that's like, I when I was a kid, I like completely ignored. And like, I was really judging before trying almost everything. Well, for me, the and first if I hadn't done that, I probably would have ended up buying I wanted a bunch of cool stuff. And I would have bought it all. It just wasn't available. And then one day, I was in Florida with a marching band trip. I think it was 10th grade. And you found a manga? And we, the last day, like, we are going to fly out, like, late in the afternoon. So we were all supposed to go into, like, Disney World or something or just, mm -hmm. like, stay in the hotel. We totally just ran off and went, like, downtown and went all over the place. And eventually, we ended up in the Virgin Megastore. And they had a gigantic manga section. Yeah, Virgin Megastore was always weird. We went to the one in New York before it closed, uh, at least the Times Square one, remember? And I remember, I'm looking around, yeah, I do remember that. And the thing was, is they had, you know, it's they only sell, it's basically a giant FYE, but they have absolutely everything, so they even have the manga. So I see the manga, and I'm like, holy shit! And my couple of friends who were into anime are like, holy shit, manga! And we're looking at it, and looking at it, and I didn't have much money left, and they didn't have much money left. And I saw, in the middle of all of it, a Tenchi manga, and I was really into Tenchi Muya. Oh, good guy. So I was like, fuck yeah, and I bought it. Nice. It was the first manga I ever bought. Mm -hmm. 
And then I've just kept reading manga from that point onward. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, anime is a sort of different, you know, I mean, I got into manga because I was in the anime club at RIT, and we went to Borders, and I saw manga there, and yep. it, I, See, was already, I, was, I was already in the anime, so there you go. So it, I was already it went super right into across anime. the table. Like, anime club at RIT, my thought was, all right, I'll meet more than a handful of people who are super into anime. Yeah. Little did I know, I thought I was hardcore until I got to RIT anime. Yeah, we, <laughs> we weren't even hardcore when we left RIT anime. I know. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, it's like I got into anime sort of like gradually. Like it wasn't something that it was the forefront of my mind. It was sort of just like, you know, I mean, obviously I watched the Transformers and the Voltron as a kid, which, you know, and all those sorts of things and Thundercats and, you know, things that were sort of anime, sort of weren't, you know, depending on what it was. And then I knew animes existed and I kind of wanted to watch them. Like, I, you know, in the late 80s, like Akira was in the newspaper and I knew that it existed. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to watch that. But it wasn't actually until, like, Toonami when I would, you know, actually, you know, like, I, would, I mean, the, the, the local station, like, syndicate Sailor Moon, but I didn't watch Sailor Moon. I watched Botsmaster. Ah. I was like, fuck Sailor Moon. See, by the time of Toonami, I already had a sizable VHS anime collection. I had already bought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of fan subs. Yeah, not at all. So when, you know, Toonami rolled around, I started watching, you know, and, and also uh, when Sci-Fi Channel, you know, did their thing. You know, like, like uh, I spent like four hundred bucks to get all of Sailor Moon because I had to get SVHS tapes and mail them to a dude. Yeah, I didn't know about fan subs existing until I got to RIT. And that's in fact that's where I got End of Ava. I didn't know what Evangelion was, Neither. but I got End of Ava, and I was like, hey, I got this anime movie, and all my friends we sat down and watched it. And at the end, they were like, Rim, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Especially when later I finally like learned what Ava was, and I started watching it. And then I thought, after a few episodes, I was like, wait a minute, I know how this ends. Oh. Uh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, in, like in high school, and even you know, pretty much from fourth grade on, I was super into anime. Anime was my second geekery. The only thing more important than anime was gaming. Mm. So I watched all the anime I could get. I rented every goddamn anime from Blockbuster. I just constantly meet. My little brother got into it. I got my parents into it. I'd watch Vampire Hunter D when I was a little kid over and over and over again. I'd wanted to dress up as him for Halloween. Yeah, see, I, you know, I, I slowly towards late, you know, once Toonami came out, there was slowly more Animes, right? I would watch more on Sci-Fi Channel. There was a week of Godzilla followed by a week of anime. I was watching the week of Godzilla movies, and the next week just happened to be week of anime movies, and I watched, like, Galaxy Express and Fatal Fury. <laughs> uh, Fatal Fury is not so good. No. It's awful. Um, <laughs> you know, and then I was sort of like, Wind all right. Amnesia. I was sort of like, like anime was a thing I wanted, but I didn't know or care enough like to try a whole bunch to get more. But like I saw RIT Anime Club and I was like, ah, oh, that's where I can get more animes. Yep. All right. I mean, we were already all through high school. Our D&D group would meet every Sunday and play for like 12 hours. Like all day, every Sunday, we'd just play D&D. Yeah, there weren't enough nerds to play D&D by me. So I had to be like, you know, when I got to RIT, I was like, all right, now I can play some fucking d and No, of D &D. course, play D&D, Which then. is the only reason we're here today. At like 10 a.m., we'd all meet and go to the grocery store and buy like $100 worth of shit. <laughs> and then we'd all converge in the basement of whoever's house. We like rotated around and we'd dick around and I want to do them for like a couple hours. And then we'd play D&D forever, get food. And then we'd watch whatever anime we were watching. And we just would get a VHS tape of every show. And we'd always say, we'll watch one episode. Then and we watched all the episodes. We'd watch every episode on the VHS tape. I think the only anime I watched on a VHS before RIT was a dubbed Akira someone lent me. I watched at least 50 anime completely on VHS before I got to RIT, probably. Wow. wow. If you count all the movies and all the OAVs individually... Mm. Yeah, probably. Yeah, a lot of it was shit. <laughs> like <laughs> Most, Project, like some of it all? was great though. Like Project Echo Everything. was such, it has such a like it's dear to me watching that stuff and Slayer. I wonder if you hadn't Ramba. seen Project Echo then and you only saw it now. I, how would you? I have met people who have watched it recently because we told them to in those anime you should see panels and they loved it. All right. And I watched the first one again recently. It's goddamn hilarious. All like, right. It really is. It holds up. Funnily, the same way that like Mahode Sky Tie holds up. All right, All right that's like fine. that level of comedy. That's fine. Yeah, of course I didn't know back then until you know recently when Gerald taught us the origin of Project Echo. <laughs> Yeah. But I even had lulls. Like I got an anime, and then I'd seen everything I could get my hands on. So I had this lull 
where I didn't watch a lot of anime until I learned I could get fan subs. I didn't learn about fan subs till RIT, and by then it was just Anime Club Library, and 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 then digital fan subs came, yep. and then so it was digital fan subs, and then there was like episode of Geekkeeper, it was like, oh, digital fan subs, and then we're still at that point. Well, see, that's how <laughs> anime fandom and manga fandom for me leveled up. It was from casual fan to voracious fan immediately, and then the next level up was when I realized there were fan subs. Yeah, but think about how I was in that late high school. Where I was just watching whatever was on TV. Yep. That's how most people are, period. They never yep. advance beyond that. I only advanced because I actively went to RIT Anime Club. Now, this is my problem with conventions like Otakon, <laughs> to bring it back around. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we always complain. It's, it's not the punk kids mm -hmm. that bother me. It's not, you know, the run, you know, kids can have their fun. There's nothing wrong with all that convention culture. What bothers me is that the conventions, as they are run, do not in any way gently push people toward getting more into anime. Yeah, the RIT Anime Club succeeded in leveling me up. If not for it, if I'd gone to some other school, I would have pretty much just been a watch an anime on TV, not even realizing dubs versus subs was an issue kind of guy. And instead, look what happened. We, we did Geek Nights. We lecture in front of thousands and Now anime I know more about anime than most people in this country. Yep. And in fact, we were complimented by a professor who studies anime and someone who worked on Minky Momo. In fact, was the main person behind Minky Momo on our surprising knowledge of anime. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could have introduced that guy to Daryl Surratt, Gerald, and Clarissa. Yeah. Or Mike Toole. Who know? Yeah, because I mean, we know more than most in this country. It's if not saying much because there are a zillion people who know more than we I do. I mean, anime, just not in the US. anime, we're like a B6, like Black Shade 6, I'd say. Gerald and they're like gray five. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. But anyway, I guess <clears throat> what the you know, the conventions don't do a good job of pushing people. And you know how why we leveled up at RIT anime it was very simple. They would tell us a little bit about the show. Like they'd show us a random show and they'd be like, Yeah, this is you know, this was done by so and so. They didn't and do it that much. They didn't do enough. No, though. they did the bare minimum though. They'd say little or they'd make in jokes, even if you didn't get them. Like yeah. they'd show us the touch movie and they'd be like, This is probably one of the most depressing things you're ever gonna see outside of Ava. Yeah, but I mean it's like Anime World Order was like the second level up, right? As soon as you listen to their show, it's like but oh mostly, I should pay attention to who the director is and then you're fully leveled up. But go back to RT anime when you wanted to check out tapes, after I'd watched every show I already knew about, I'd be looking around, and one of the older guys who was running the club at the time, because we were just young punk freshmen yet, you know, we were called the front row crew because we were a group of assholes who sat in the front row and heckled and made noise, and they thought about kicking us out of the club, and then we mm -hmm. took the club over and ran it for many years. But we were just punk kids, and I'd be standing there looking through the anime, and I didn't recognize any of it. And the older guys would be like, hey, you should watch this. And they'd give me, like, KO Century Beast. I'd be like, what's it about? They'd be like, just watch it. Mm -hmm. And I did. And that alone got me into whole swaths of anime that I never would have seen. Uh, I did watch a whole bunch of stuff uh, at RIT Anime Club, right, that I never would have seen. Like, say, Kishin Core. Coo. or Koo. Uh, which I still I can't find Koo for the life of me. If I hadn't seen it there, I never would have seen it. Yeah. Or uh, Horror's Prince of Sun, right? But it was like... I still didn't really fully get them until no, anime later. No, World Order was, was the next was, level up. It wasn't until much later that I appreciated what I had seen. Yep. I mean, I think back that I had access to all of, you know, such classics as Marmalade Boy or Kimigiri Orange Road. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, I watched a lot of that anime, <laughs> and it was because people just told me to, and I was like, okay, yeah. I trust these people. They know more than I do. Yep. And manga, that was the same thing. Like, I was into manga, but I only read manga that I already knew. Yeah, I pretty much I started out buying mangas that went along with animes that I already was watching. Like, I bought up, the Initial D manga. Yep. I bought the Akira manga. My level up was very specific. It was Luke and Skojo. One day, we were at a convention, like an Otakon, and we were look, walking around, and one of them said something like, you gotta look in the dollar bins. That's where you find the crazy stuff like Sanctuary. And I was like, what's Sanctuary? And I read the first volume of Sanctuary. Yeah. And that was like a that was the moment of revelation. I was like, there's manga like this? <laughs> I believe it was more something along the lines of someone was like, yeah, there's a manga about a Yakuza and a politician and something, something. And we eventually found it. And then we were in business. It was mostly that there was this, we were told to look in discount bins 
because you'll find the good stuff there. Mm-hmm. And we were given a small list of awesome titles, which led us to other awesome titles, which eventually yeah, well, led they us de- to... Yeah, they definitely led us to the eagle direction yep. as well. And then eventually, I start, we started to notice who wrote things, and that... That wasn't until much later. Yeah, but it happened. <clears throat> but yeah, you know, mangas, I bought them at Borders, you know, and I was only buying a few... And then I started going to the comic shop, so I was seeing some more mangas at the comic shop and also media play. But, uh, you know, there were only so many that I was actually interested in, and I was pretty picky. But then, finally, when I got out of RIT and I had a whole pile of money, I was going to the, um, you know, the physical comic shop in New York City every week. And then eventually when I couldn't go there anymore because I moved to Beacon, I was doing a mail order from the same shop. And then I said, wait a minute, if I'm mail ordering, I can mail order from this other place for half price. Yep. <laughs> and then, But because I was doing that, I was seeing the order form. So I knew at that point every single manga that was coming out every single month. Because, you I mean, you go to sh- – a lot of people go – just a lot of people, even comic fans, right – they're basically the equivalent of what I was to anime in high school. They'll watch it on TV. So these people in comics, they go to the comic shop and they look at the shelf every week, right? And they just buy what they see what they like, like I was doing uh, at Comics Etc. in Rochester. And the problem with that is that most, the vast majority of comic shops, like 99%, don't buy everything there is. They nope. can't afford to buy everything there is. So if you just look at the shelf, you won't know everything there is. And the only way for you to know everything there is is to get that stupid fucking catalog for $4 or do the online ordering with the place that gives you the spreadsheet that I get, right? Uh, or And even then, they'll sell you the stupid catalog or send you free copies of the stupid catalog without you asking for it and filling up your trash bin. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once you get that... You can see everything that's coming out, and you can say, look at all these mangas that are being printed in English that I didn't even know existed, or look at all these comics coming out from indie publishers that I didn't even know existed. And ah, that, the indie publishers. And that is like the highest level that you can get, is now you see with your eyeballs every comic that is available to you, and also the web comics. Don't leave out the web comics either, right? Which I started reading R.I.T. since the year 2000. I've been reading... Many, many web comics every single day. It was really at RIT. You know what got us into web comics? Like for real, it was back then. Mega Tokyo and Penny Arcade. It was. You know what? I, it, I got and be, real life comics. I got to be perfectly honest. It was pretty much just Mega Tokyo, right? Somehow I ended up at it, and I was reading it every day. We all read it and talked about it. Yep. Like we were like, oh man, did you read Mega Tokyo? Yeah. I wonder what's gonna happen. Oh man. And Largo. like even in those earliest of days, like for a couple months, I was like, fuck your 8-bit theater and your Penny Arcade. Yeah, I was reading 8-bit theater because I found that shit hilarious. But I was not like, everyone else did. I was not a fan of those immediately. I was. I think I was against them the same way I was against all the other comics in the comic shop. Yeah, it was basically I hit Mega Tokyo and I was like, oh shit. Web comics, and then I read a million web comics, realized they all sucked, pared it down. It's pretty much like yeah, real life. It was like I, I added all these web comics because I was like, web comics are a thing. So I started getting a whole bunch of them, and then I got rid of a bunch of them. And some of them ended, and some of them started. And do you remember? Eight bad boys of computer That's science. That's right. We gave <laughs> that fucker from the bad boys of computer science money. The greatest, the- worst web comic in all It wasn't of history. that great, but one. Actually, it was pretty great. It was Not great. YouTube it was why it was great. Too. Other than the fact that they drank heavily, the characters, it was very similar to our experiences at RIT. Yeah. And they also were as obsessed with Tribes 2 as we were. Yep. That was it. Yeah. That, that's the main reason. Bad and Boys of Computer Science was the shit. It was that real life 8-bit theater. I read College Romeo's from Hell. So did Greg. Almost no one else did. I didn't read that. Uh, I remember reading a lot of weird stuff, like Not Gonna Take It. I done by Mer- that that was done by Meredith Gren back in the day. Right, so here's the web comics I'm reading right now. Ready? Uh, those are all newspaper comics that happen Dr. to also be on the web. All right, so Real Life, Penny Arcade, Dr. McNinja, XKCD, Wondermark, Johnny Wander, Order of the Stick, Freak Angels, Gun Show, Hark a Vagrant, Axe Cop, Gastrophobia, which I talked about uh, recently. I really like Gastrophobia. And do you know what has returned? What has returned? The greatest webcomic of all time. The Bad Boys of Computer Science? No. The Boy on a Stick. Oh. And Slither. And I'd given up on Boasis. He, he's got a new art style, too. We used to be really into Boasis. Yeah, he's got a new art style and everything. It's pretty awesome. All right. Yeah. You yeah. like that? Yeah. But all that started from Mega Tokyo. So, never, ever, 
actually legitimately make fun of some kid who gets into anime from Naruto because that's how most people get into yeah, everything. There's nothing wrong, right, with the guy who gets into something through something stupid, right? Who moves on to the hardcore from a casual thing, right? Everyone, no, even the hardest core guy started out with something lame, right? No one starts out just playing Battletech out of the womb, right? They played Monopoly and then Risk and then something else, right? I mean, who plays Battletech first thing? I no- was into board games for most of my life. I was hardcore into Monopoly. You I would know? play full Monopoly games against myself to try and solve it. I mean, ba- you know, all, all that time that I was buying those superhero cards and those comic books, you know what I was spending even more money on? Magic the fucking Gathering. Yep. You know, so I mean, while I look down on it now, it was still, it had its purpose. And the only thing you got to look down on is not, you know, starting in these things. They shouldn't exist. It's that failing to move on from those things. But if, at the I, same if time, I was still I can't playing blame Magic people, now, that would be sad. I can't blame people who don't move on because they're never presented with it. Because look at all the things if we're If I was into. still reading Mega Tokyo now, that'd be sad. But at the same time, look at us. Most of our leveling ups were external things. Like, we would put in the first half of the effort. Like, I'll go to RIT Anime. But RIT Anime returned with Mega the second Tokyo half. Tokyo still exists. Here's some shit. Like, here's stuff. Yep. There was, there was this kind of an event that would push us to the next level at every step of the way. Yeah, it's like and I put in one half of the effort, which was... This RIT is clearly a nerdy school. It has an anime club. It has computers. I want to go there. And then I actually went to those clubs, and that was the extent of my beginning efforts. So look at look at conventions. Oh, and when I went to the RWAG, I said, I want to play D&D and raise my hand. That was the extent of my efforts. Yep, and RWAG said, here's a guy who smoked more weed than he should have who's going to run one and a half awesome sessions of Dungeons & Dragons. And if that guy was a horrible guy... Damn it, that guy. <laughs> Damn but it, that guy. You know what? If not for that guy, geek, we would not be here today. No geek nights, no front row No crew, nothing. None of this would have happened. If not for that lame guy. So it is a, always a lame thing that is going to get you somehow started in the awesomeness. So let's end on, because you know it's Wednesday, getting into conventions. Something like X-Men TV show. Because I just complained about how I don't think anime conventions do a good job of providing the second half of the effort to get people more into it. Yep. And as a result, they're kind of falling in many ways. Yep. But look at a con like the Penny Arcade Expo. A lot of people go there and say things like, I've never played an indie RPG, but holy shit, look at those indie RPGs. Yeah, but I there also play one. are a lot of people who go to those conventions and they'll sit there and they'll just... Do the one thing that they want to do, and that's ah, it. But they don't put forth the effort. They don't put forth the first half and say, the I want to try something new. The first half was coming to PAX. That was the first half. I don't know. I feel like now you've got to settle for the first half is expressing even the tiniest of interest in anything. Mm. And you got to just follow up from there. I mean, how many guys go to PAX and stay in the expo hall the entirety of the time and never leave it? I think a lot of the people I see who are playing the single-player games at the conventions, it's really an issue of... They're not super social, and they came to the con alone. They don't know how to strike up a conversation. Well, also think about this, right? If I was a little kid, right, when you would go to Toys R Us, there would be like a Super Nintendo there with Super Metroid, and you'd be like, oh, my I'd be there until my parents dragged me out. That's right. Now, imagine if you still had that mindset, and you went to PAX. You could go into the console free play, ask for all these games that your parents wouldn't buy you that you don't have. You could check them out and just play them. Yeah, but these dudes are like 30. I'm just saying is that, you know, that would be, you know, if you still had that mindset of stay at the Super Nintendo demo machine for three hours, then console free play at PAX is freaking amazing to you because you could just be like, give me a, give me a fucking, fucking uh, Soul Calibur. And you just, oh my God, I got Soul Calibur, right? <laughs> So, uh, but how did we start with all this though? Our, you know, we never heard as much as I was into anime. I didn't even know anime conventions existed. Well, I mean, I sort of understood, you know, from watching TV that there was like Star Trek conventions. No, that's what exactly. Existed. I knew that there were two, there were three kinds of conventions: professional conventions that were boring, Star Trek conventions, and gaming cons. Because I went to gaming cons. From little kid okay, to mom. I did go to a Magic the Gathering tournament event once. I went to many of high, those. Right, in middle school. But I also went to, like, Michigan, just straight up. This was a con where you pay per event, and I played, like, eight-hour D&D games. Uh, Everyone there was fat and 40. I didn't know that kind of thing existed until I much knew, later. I knew, but I didn't know there was anime. Like, it never even crossed my mind that there would be an anime equivalent of those I didn't even understa- fully understand that there was a convention. Like, I saw on TV there would be references to Star Trek conventions, not, you know, like, in other shows that were nerdy. So I was like, oh, I guess there are Star Trek 
things, and I didn't like Star Trek, so I didn't care. I didn't know until I went to one. The first Michigan I went to, I, br- I brought my, all my D&D books, and I brought all these characters, because I was like, what I have to... I think I thought I had to bring my characters. <laughs> and I brought all my magic cards. Yep. And I look... I didn't... I was like, how do I play a game? And this fat guy was like, you gotta go sign up. Mm-hmm. So I go, and I pay my, like, five bucks, and I signed up for this magic tournament that I lost... And then I signed up for this eight-hour-long D&D game that was part of a tournament. And this dungeon master dude ran this tournament D&D session where we, like, busted into a pyramid. And and that was, like, this moment of realization. I was like, this is the awesomest thing ever. Mm. I'm here, far away from home. It's, like, two in the morning. No parents. Mm. I'm playing D&D. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And I just kept going to gaming cons. Yeah. And then at RIT, one day, someone was like, "Hey, you want to go to an uh, you want to go to an anime convention?" Well, I mean, like at RIT, they always during the announcements they would say things about conventions, right? But they, well, they would say like Otakon is coming, and I'd be like, "Meh, I didn't know what that was." I, like, I did, they weren't ex- exactly explicit. Like, no one ever said like there is a thing called a convention. A whole bunch of nerds get together in a hotel or convention center you pay an admission fee and then all these things are there and this might sound crazy they to were you, so unexplicit that we i didn't know i they'd I say like we're going to otakon and i was like i don't even know what that I is i completely glossed over what they were saying like i didn't care and i didn't get it and they weren't so you know they didn't say it very well so i didn't comprehend it completely and then somehow someone was like we're going to ohio con you know do you want to go to ohio con and i was like and I, I sort of finally got it. Like, there's going to be some sort of anime event. Here's in what Ohio. I was told. I remember this pretty clearly. I don't remember which of the upperclassmen who are now part of the front row crew told us this, but I remember I, because, you know, back then I didn't know them. So they're just like faceless entities that told me stuff all the time, vaguely authoritative. But I mean, perhaps remember, they were a blur. There was a time. Oh my God. I forgot all about him. Okay. Ken Hashimoto, <laughs> the blur, who stole Mosh Mosh Revolution from us, which was fine. You're allowed to. <laughs> Ideas are worth nothing, but took credit for it himself. Anyway. So one of those people, I mean, we used to look up to Scott Johnson as an authority figure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, got, I was under the impression from these people that anime conventions, Ohio Con would consist of the following. There's tons of girls there in cosplay. What is that? They're cute. Mm -hmm. There's gaming there. There is a place where artists just draw anime shit and you can buy it. Yep. And it's awesome. Yep. You can buy anime shit and it's awesome. You'll get laid. (laughs) I was told all these things. See, I had been going Oh, and you can watch anime there. See, I had gone to youth group conventions in high school where you were also told that you would be laid. Yep. But there was no nerdiness going on there. It was- it was just awesomeness. So what do we do? We're so pumped. The whole, almost like half the front row crew, we all go to this convention in Ohio. And we most drive. of what we wanted to do was play DDR. Yep. So we, because DDR, like we, there DDR, were no DDR machines. That was when the DDR iron was the hottest. There were no DDR machines. We were like desperate. We would like freak out. Like I'd get, someone would IM me on AIM and be like, I heard there's DDR. And people would like flock to a mall to find a broken pump it up machine. <laughs> <laughs> so... We go to this con. We drive to goddamn motherfucking Ohio yep. to go to Ohio con, and we walk in, and it was one of the most disappointing experiences of my entire life. I wasn't really, I, I don't know, I wasn't disappointed at the time, right? But over time of being there, I realized that it was kind of crummy, but, but it was also the first anime con, and there was stuff there yep, that I, I bought- had not seen. It was like this small sampling. It was like... It was like it was like you go there expecting a chocolate bar, like a whole Hershey bar, and you get just one square of a Hershey bar. But it had everything. Like there was an artist alley. I'd never seen that before. Dealer's room, never seen that before. I bought fan art, and it was awesome. I didn't even think. I bought actually a pretty good uh, Unicron fan art. Yeah, I bought this thing. It was like Vosh the Stampede and uh, knives as punk kids. I bought a, a volume of Trigun Dojinshi that I thought was actual Trigun manga, but wasn't. <laughs> yep, I remember that. I bought a uh, Apollo World that you can zipper up into a Pokeball for a dollar. But uh, all is not lost because while, it, you know, we say it was this worst convention. Really, in retrospect, it was just very poorly run. Really poorly run? The number of anecdotes that came out of that convention was legendary. That's where the Duck Hunt tournament happened. Yep. That we all won. That's where we played Settlers and Midget Whores. No played, exaggeration, no hyperbole whatsoever. I can't believe, to this day, I look back on that and I'm like, 
that's the kind of bullshit story I would make up. And yet, not only did it happen, but you were there, and you would call me on it if we made that we shit up. We absolutely, 100%, no exaggeration or hyperbole or lying or anything, played Settlers of Catan with a midget whore and a non-midget ugly whore. She wasn't that ugly. She was just old. Well, I mean, she, you know, she wasn't a whore. She was whore. a whore. Yeah. Straight up. A whore and a midget whore. Oh, my God. The whores. There were so many whores. <laughs> we're not even exact. It, it, literally whores. And independently, cosplay girls trying to quote unquote hook up with people, but really didn't have rooms and just needed somewhere to sleep. Oh, and there was uh, like Stevie B's cat girls. Oh my god! And there was the sa- the really tall Sailor Moon cross dress and Sailor Bubba, and yeah. Oh yeah. So we, but then you know, from there we leveled up. We gave Anime Cons a second chance, and someone was like, "No, we got to go to Otakon." That's and we went to Otakon O two, and it was mind blowing. That was that was and the I real remember deal. We got so excited because eventually we're like, "They're gonna let us be panelists. We're gonna be on the Anime Club Summit." Oh my god! <gasps> And now we basically, well, Otakon probably won't ever let us come back. No, but, but other other people do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's how we got into doing panels and how Geek Nights kind of formed as well. And uh, da, 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 I think we've talked enough. We talked enough. The point is, you know, we all started with stupid shit. But don't make a mistake. A lot of people, you know, they think, aha, I started with something stupid and I want to introduce this person to my geekery. Don't start them off with something stupid. <laughs> Unless you're an expert. <laughs> Experts can start people with something stupid. Yeah, it's like I started... I mean, let's Fist see. of the North Star is stupid. Don't even pretend it's not. I love it, but it is stupid. It's like, like the first anime I ever saw was a bad dub of some piece of crap on, like, you know, Project Echo. Well, what happens well, it's here's like, the failing. One, well, the dub's not that got, bad. Yeah, no, but I'm saying, you know... That but doesn't here, mean that you should start your friend off on Project Echo. Well, here's, here's why I'm saying experts. Only pros can get away with that, because... It wasn't the crappy fan sub of Aiko that was the moment. Like, that wasn't good in and of itself. You have to recreate the whole experience. Like, a lot of the crappy anime that I watched early on, the reason it worked and made me more interested in anime is because I watched it late at night after playing D&D in a dark basement with a bunch of my nerd friends. And also because it was rare. Yeah, it was weird. Di- there was weird, no other way to different, get it. and difficult to obtain. So unless you can replicate all those factors... Showing someone the crappy fan sub anime that itself is crap objectively, it's not going to work. Nope. So unless you're a pro, show them Cowboy Bebop. That's right. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. Or a Rotsuka Doji.